the, uh, just as a reminder for myself as well, song invitation 774, correct? Okay. Oh. At the closing. Closing, not invitation. Closing 774. Good thing I asked. All right, so for this morning's lesson, continuing in our studies, and if you've been keeping up with our, our daily devotionals, you might recognize a few points from today, uh, in today's sermon from our readings, because I thought they were, I wasn't just trying to take the easy way out, I promise. I uh, genuinely thought some of the points that were made in our readings this week were, were just significant enough that they deserve to be said again, repeated again. To, to train us in righteousness. And because today's word is uh, it's a heavy one, right? We, we, we've had a few weeks of some easy topics, talking about holiness and grace and love and kindness, all those pretty words that we like to think about. Uh, but as we dedicated a former lesson to sin, and that one was a pretty heavy one, uh, today's lesson is, is judgment. Everyone's favorite word. And I don't want this lesson to be heavy. That's actually one of the misconceptions uh, we'll be looking at today and addressing. Uh, if you would, go ahead and grab your, your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And while we turn there together, 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, I'm going to ask you a, a question for your consideration. Uh, I guess really three questions. How many of you are fearful for our, I'll just say, global future, kind of the direction of the world in general? I mean, I've, I've got concerns. Uh, what about for our, just here, just our own nation's future, have, have certain fears and concerns? Yeah, I, I think unless you've been living under a rock, which might be a pretty good place to live these days, uh, there's reasons for us to have some fears and some concerns. Uh, and now let's really, let's really hit it home. How many of you are, are fearful for the, the future of your, your children and your grandchildren, uh, seeing kind of the direction our society is going? Uh, seeing a lot, of, a lot of head nodding. There's a lot of concern. Uh, uh, just to share a personal uh, concern or anecdote, uh, so my, my grandma Woody, uh, who who passed away, my dad's mom, who passed away almost three years ago. Uh, I'm I'm fearful if she were alive today, she'd probably die of a heart attack. Seeing how much more open and pervasive sin has become just in the past three years alone, the way that. Sins have entered our, our schools and libraries, family-friendly community event atmospheres, beer cans and Nike products. It seems to be inescapable and unavoidable how normalized sin is becoming. And one of the last conversations I ever had with, with Grandma Woody was actually uh, around my birthday. I won't say it was on my birthday, but I remember it was around my birthday. It was about a month before she passed. And she told me, uh, you know the typical grandma stuff, how proud she was. But she also made an intentional point to let me know how scared, her word scared, it stands out to me, she was for, for Edwin's future. Um, because of how prevalent sin was becoming even then, and has been for since humans have been on this earth, really. Uh, but the sin's been normalized to the point that literally just two days ago on Friday, I had a conversation with a good friend of mine who was expressing uh, his fears of being fired from his job. Uh, why? Uh, because he is in a management position. Uh, and so he has to submit routine performance reviews for his team that he oversees. And he has one employee that has been underperforming by a lot and for a long time. And not only is there a, a, an insufficiency in the job performance, but also in the character that this employee, it's well known, uh, this employee causes a lot of drama and tension unnecessarily between colleagues. It's, it's the type of person that just provokes division. That type of personality that I'm sure many of us have encountered before. And so he submits his honest review as the manager of her performance. 
Um, the problem, though, is that this employee belongs to a, a certain number of minority groups um, that are receiving special status today and is now claiming that he is discriminating um, not based on performance, but based on these minority characteristics. Uh, and so now he's worried that he might get fired for simply telling the truth. Because the truth hurts. Because the truth made that person look bad and, and feel, quote unquote, oppressed. And so that is the type of world that we're living in. We're simply sharing the truth is oftentimes punished. And so if you share any of these concerns and fears for our future and, and for our children, I, I want to offer up to you uh, the, the wise words of, of Peter. Uh, so starting in verse 4. I'm going to read verses 4 through 10. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned... Let me get the slide caught up here, sorry. If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. If God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, if he rescued righteous Lot, who was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. I think we can relate to Lot there, can't we? That those of us who are doing our best to practice righteousness are tormented by the sins that we see around us. But I digress. Picking up in verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Uh, folks, I want us to notice a few important points from this passage as, as we prepare our minds to consider the word judgment. First, we can take comfort in knowing that God's ways are higher than ours, that He knows how to protect and rescue the godly. Though we may have many fears concerning the direction of the world, concerning the ways the world may treat us for our unwavering stance on God's word, we know that his word is the only firm foundation in this life. An unchanging and unchangeable standard. And it is by his word that he promises rescue. And so our primary concern is not to be what happens to us in this body, but our concern needs to be if we are living a godly life. That's where our focus should be. Are we living a godly life? Because it is only the godly that he will rescue. So what does that mean for others? Well, our, our second point to consider from this passage is that judgment brings freedom. That's something you don't hear much today. Condemning judgment for one group of people is what sets free the other group. Uh, this was made very, uh, say, obvious to me in a, in a, a chart-topping country song right now. It's on the radio. I don't listen to a lot of radio, but I was driving to a doctor's appointment this week, and I, I heard this country song. Uh, the title of it's Wait in the Truck. Anybody who listens to country music, I'm sure you've heard it because it's, it's a chart topper. And now, biblically speaking, the ethic of vengeance that is in that song, I, I just can't defend from Scripture. I'm sorry. As, as hoorah of a song as it is, I, I just can't stand on the, the vengeful component of that song. But, but there's one important principle that, that we can learn from from that song that is found in our passage here, and that is that without justice... Evil will continue to reign and to break more lives. 
You see, in the song, there's this girl who has endured great physical bloody abuse and, and seemingly has for some time. And she is set free from that abuse uh, when her abuser faces judgment. You see, judgment is freeing for those who are innocent. And Peter gives two examples of this. The way that uh, both Noah and Lot are in environments where they are surrounded by sin, and yet their families were rescued. Uh, for Noah, these sins were global and truly inescapable. The, the only righteous family on all the earth was, was, was Noah's family. And yet it was God who delivers Noah up out of that. You see, when the flood waters came, Noah's family was saved from the sins of the world. And in the time of Lot, being in the, living in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that were entirely pervasive except for Lot's family, it, Lot was rescued by the judgment of the fire and brimstone and the destruction. In each case, both Noah and Lot's families uh, were given freedom by God by God's judgment. You see, it meant condemning judgment for one group of people is what set free another group of people, the ones that were innocent, the ones that were godly. But keep in mind that in both of these cases, the sinners uh, had opportunity to repent, but they rejected it. So it wasn't that God unexpectedly, capriciously, suddenly just brought down this judgment. There was warning given. And the unrighteous, the ungodly, did not heed the warning. They chose to continue living in their fleshly pleasure instead of pursuing God's, God's will and God's desires. And so the, the third thing that, that we take from this passage is that there will be a final judgment. It, it, judgment is inescapable. It is going to happen. And that's something that we're going to continue to talk about as we move through this lesson. But, but a fourth point that I want to offer up is that uh, we see here that judgment has always been resisted. We see of Peter describing that they despise authority. You see, in, in Noah's time, we know that he was, as he's building the ark, he's also being a herald of righteousness. He is actively going out and preaching repentance to the lost. And yet we know that it was only Noah's family that was saved. They continued, as Jesus remarks, they continued to eat, drink, and be merry. In Luke 17, 26 and 27. All the way up until the door of the ark was sealed and the floodwaters started to come down. And so we can just imagine their outcries as Noah is building this magnificent ark and telling them, guys, I'm, I'm doing this because judgment day is coming. The waters are coming. The flood's coming. Destruction's coming. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. And, and we can just imagine their voice saying, you can't tell me how to live, Noah. Who are you to judge me? Who are you to tell me I'm wrong? And we can also... Just imagine the heartache that Noah might have felt as the doors were sealed shut, knowing that everyone he had been preaching to before was lost when those doors were sealed shut. Yeah. Similarly, in Lot's time, we know that he had been pleading with the men to not commit those heinous sex crimes. And yet the more that he begged them to cease their behavior, the greater their lust grew. Lust that wasn't stopped until the cities were destroyed. And is that not the pattern that we see today? That as we proclaim truth, as we proclaim salvation through Christ, the more that we warn others of the eternal consequences of unrighteous actions, the more angrily they protest and the more openly they commit their sins. That it's sins that were once only committed at night and in secret and in private are now spilling forth on full display on TV shows in concert halls, at libraries, in elementary schools, for all the world to see, and they do it in the name of pride. The attribute that goes before guaranteed destruction. And that's simply the nature of man. We despise authority. Now, how many of us have told our wives we're going to try to lose, lose some weight, 
And then come, you get the midnight rumblies and you go rummaging through the fridge and, and then you get caught red-handed. And you feel that, that panic. It's like, oh, and you kind of freeze and you get that deer in the headlights. It looks like, oh, no, i gotta, I got to make up an excuse. Oh, oh, I was, I, you know, I, I, I know it's midnight, but uh, I just felt like the refrigerator needed organized. <laughs> I had to, had to make sure all the water bottles were in there. You know, you start coming up with all these excuses. You know, with kids, hey, kids, you got a bedtime. It's 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever your bedtime is. And then at, at say, your bedtime is 8 o'clock, and then 8.30, your parents see a, a light underneath your door, and you hear their footsteps, and you try to, try to turn off the lamp real quick and jump back in bed and cover over, and, and you pretend to be sleeping. Right? Because, because why? Because we hate judgment. We hate being caught when we're doing something we know we shouldn't be doing. All of us feel it. All of us feel that guilt. And because of that, we try to avoid situations in which we're going to feel judged. We avoid people that we think are going to tell us we are in the wrong. That is just common to all humans. We don't like judgment. That's, so that's part of this, the stick with free will, right? This blessing of free will that we have, it comes at the price uh, that at some times it can feel like the sting of a curse. Uh, see, free will is a responsibility to use it for good. So we have the choice. That's what free will is. It's the choice. We can use our free will to do good or to do evil. Uh, we can serve God or we can serve ourselves. We can, we can use our free will to submit ourselves to a higher standard of living God's way. Or we can use our free will to relish in the, the pride of pursuing unrestrained pleasure. And, and Peter, he doubles down on, on this point in chapter 3. Uh, this concept of judgment is the very reason that Peter is writing this letter. Because there were false teachers who were saying there was not going to be a judgment. And so Peter's correcting them. He's warning them. No, 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 no. Judgment day is coming. Judgment day is coming. And verses 3 through 9 of chapter 3. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. You see, Peter, he's doubling down and says, guys, listen, Jesus is coming back. And when that happens, all that you know will be burned up. It will be dissolved. It will be no more. All of mankind's deeds in this life will be exposed. There, there is no such thing as a secret sin. There is no such thing as, well, I'll, I'll wait until everyone goes to bed and then I'll raid the fridge. That way no one knows about it, right? There is no such thing as a secret sin. God knows all, and all will be exposed on judgment. And those who are saved, who have had their sins pardoned, when they appear before the judgment seat, they'll be clothed in the purity and the perfection of Christ, and they will be welcomed home. But those that are lost, they will be condemned for their sins and their rejection of Christ. There's no in-between. There is no middle ground. It's one or the other. And that's why Peter makes this powerful transition to conclude his letter in some of the final verses in this chapter 3. Uh, you see, most of this letter has been warnings against false teachers. But then when he gets to the judgment, he, he makes the teaching personal. Because of this, verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. You see, Peter says, because there's a final judgment, that ought to change how you live today. We need to live with the end in sight, with our eyes focused on that coming judgment. We need to begin every day looking forward to the end. 
That's our goal. That's our finish line for this life. Uh, Final judgment ought to be what shapes our lives and how we make decisions here and now. With that day of judgment in view, we need to live holy, godly, spotless lives and be at peace with God. You know, each one of these words could be a sermon uh, on their own, but since our focus specifically is on the word judgment today, uh, I'll propose this thought to you. Uh, If we're to live holy, godly, spotless lives, that would require us practicing righteous judgment now. So that we won't be surprised come final judgment. Or, uh, to say it another way, the better that we are at practicing righteous judgment now, the more prepared we will be for final judgment. You see, to practice righteous judgment, we need to accept a certain truth, and that is everyone judges. Everyone judges. And if, if you think that's offensive to say as... Most of the world, most of our society will tell us, hey, you can't judge. Don't offend me. Don't upset me. Uh, Well, if you think it's offensive to say that everyone judges, then you just judged my statement as offensive. You see, folks, judging and judgment, it just means to discern, to distinguish. You see, our culture teaches us that judging, it's, it's a great offense. It's a social crime. It's something that should never be done. But yet we judge every single day. It's necessary for our physical and spiritual well-being to be good judges. You see, when you, when you get ready for work in the mornings, you make judgments as to what you're going to wear. You, you make a judgment as to what you're going to eat for breakfast. Uh, you make a judgment on what you will fill your mind with when you drive to work. We have to judge poisonous foods from safe foods. That is a judgment call. When we stop at a gas station and we, we see some shady characters, you know, maybe they either got their hoods up, hands in the pockets, maybe a mask on, you know, the criminal type, we have to make a judgment call. Are we going to go to another gas station or are we going to stay here and let the kids out? <laughs> we, we have to make judgments. But also, spiritually speaking, when we're staring a personal temptation of ours in the face, we have to make a judgment. We embrace the temptation and give in to sin or... We make the judgment call, "Ah, I'm not going to sin, I'm going to turn away, I'm going to run from this one. Everyone judges, and where there is no judgment, death will soon follow, because we're going to eat that poisonous mushroom, or we're going to be living in sin that results in eternal death. And in John 7, 24, Jesus even commands us to exercise a righteous judgment. And in that context of John chapter 7, Jesus is teaching his audience that our judgments must be Logical and consistent, consistently in line with God's word. Because what he is accusing the Pharisees of doing is misapplying God's word. That the judgment that they were holding for themselves was different than the judgment that they were holding other people to. It's that hypocritical judgment. They weren't consistently applying God's word. And as we have been doing our readings this week, James also tells us that our judgments are not to be on superficial things, right? We don't, we don't judge others based on how they look, how much money they have, how they dress, whether they come in and they're dirty or they're clean, whether it's a, a gazillionaire driving up in a stretch limo or it's a, a homeless man with a shopping cart. We do, we do not treat them differently. We do not judge based on these physical things. Absolutely not. That type of vain judgment is sinful. That is unrighteous judgment. We are to judge conduct. We're to judge ourselves and others based on deeds and needs. What does someone else need that I can help them with? How can God use me to be a blessing in someone else's life? What behaviors are they doing or am I doing that perhaps deserve compliments? Give praise. Build one another up. But also, what behaviors need a call to repentance? These types of judgments are righteous judgments. Which brings us to the most infamous teaching on judgment in all of Scripture. And as case in point, Google helped me out. Because when I typed in Matthew 7, 1 through 5 on Google Images, every single picture that came back only quoted, judge not. (laughs) 
<laughs> and neglected the rest of the passage. And I was like, well, this is just case in point. That is the way that the passage is so frequently taught today. So judge not is that mantra that, that we hear repeatedly. But no matter how popular it is, it misses the full context of what Jesus is teaching. Uh, if we read all five verses relating to judging, we, we see that Jesus is specifically addressing a merciless and hypocritical judgment. We see that Jesus is talking about that judgment that sees all the problems of someone else, but doesn't see the problems of self. And, and so I'll offer up this analogy. Instead of using the language that Jesus uses as a, as a beam and a speck, uh, I'll offer up this illustration from, from what I wrote on Wednesday. Imagine that you and a friend are sitting on some sandy shores. You're sitting out on the beach. And so your friend has an eyelash fall in her eye, and it's, it's causing great irritation. And so you want, you want to help your friend. Uh, but you have this choice. Uh, you can condemn her for being inadequate at pulling the, the eyelash out of her own eye, or you can say, I want to help you with that problem that you're having there. So being the good friend that you are, in your judgment, you decide to be loving and gracious and help her. The problem is that just as you go to do that, a wave washes up and splashes sand up in your eye. Well, now you have another judgment call to make. You can take the sand out of your eye, or you can continue in your blindness to try to take the lash out of her eye. It is a judgment call that you now have to make. And if you choose to try to take the lash out of her eye, while you've got all that sand blinding you in yours, you're only going to cause a greater offense. You're only going to aggravate her eye worse. Meanwhile, you're going to stay blind. The correct judgment call is to take the sand out of your eye. Get your eye clean, then you can see clearly to help your brother, help your sister. Get that beam, get that speck, get that lash out of their eye. This is righteous judgment. So when it comes to judging a person's behavior, we need to ask some very important questions. Number one, is it something that I'm also doing wrong? Secondly, how can I voice this judgment in a compassionate and edifying way? Right? When we do this in a, in a, a purpose of expressing a judging, quote-unquote, judging opinion, we need to do it in a way that does not seek to tear others down, but in a way that builds one another's up. You know, Paul echoes this sentiment in Galatians 6. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We are fulfilling the law of Christ when we help each other with our sins and temptations. And that means we guard our own hearts to the best of our ability... But if we're stumbling, we allow a brother to pass judgment and say, hey, you're in sin. You're right, I am. Have that humility to accept judgment from a brother or sister who's trying to help you. But in like manner, if you see a brother or sister struggling, help them. Lead them to repentance. Lead them to righteousness. It is about building one another up. And why do we do this? Why is practicing righteous judgment so important to get us back to where we started? Because there is going to be a final judgment. And in 2 Corinthians verses 5, 1 through 11, we see Paul's description of, of this final judgment as well. Uh, if you want to turn there, I'm going to read, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to start, I'm just going to start in verse 1, 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. 
We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. See, in this, in this passage of judgment and of final judgment, Paul is describing a Christian life as being one that is unafraid of judgment, that has courage and comfort in knowing what judgment day will bring. That, that is a far cry from, from many out in the, in the world today that will, that will teach and will preach that we can't be certain of our salvation. Paul seems to think we absolutely can be. That we can face the judgment of Christ with courage. Because we know that we have lived for Him. No matter how beaten and broken and lowly our bodies may become, we will one day be at peace in our everlasting body and our eternal home. And because we know this, we can have good courage we can live in dedicated service to God. And from this teaching of courage, Paul then shifts to reminding them that, yes, our eternal home is something that we can look forward to and expect. But fear does play a role. Because on that judgment day, those that have no reason to live in courage those that are living unrighteous lives, those that are living in sin, they will face condemnation. It is that fate of the faithless that ought to drive our evangelism. And it also ought to remind us of the consequences should we ever turn our backs on God. Then we better be living with the greatest of fear if we turn our backs on God. John tells us in 1 John 4.18 that when we are serving God, love perfected has no fear. Love perfected is that which serves God and has the utmost courage. But the fear of judgment for a faithless life plays an important role in keeping us humble and repentant. See, final judgment may be the end of this life, but it is only the beginning of of our eternity. That is a guarantee and a certainty. And so I'll close by asking these questions. Are you prepared for the final judgment? If not, why not? What's stopping you from, from being prepared? Are you preparing for it? You know, preparing for judgment, preparing for Jesus' return it is not is is not like preparing for a tornado. All right, how, how do you prepare for a tornado? Well, once a year, you go down into your cellar and you make sure the green bean can isn't expired, right? Yeah. All right. The the cellar's not flooded, and the green bean cans or the or the Vienna sausages or whatever canned foods you have in your basement, you go down once a year to make sure all the food's still good and hasn't expired, and then you forget about it. That's not what preparing for Jesus' return is like. Preparing for final judgment, preparing for His return, is making the choice to live and walk daily in the Spirit of God. And is that final judgment something that you are looking forward to? Is it something that you take courage and comfort in knowing that Jesus is coming back? If your answer to any of these is no, then how can we help you? How can we pray with you? Can we baptize you? Can we help bear some other burden in your life that is holding you back from that courage and comfort of faith in Christ? Whatever your needs are, we ask that you would let us know as together we stand and sing.